Amen. Wow. What great worship. Today we're going to talk about what happens when Jesus is in the house. I hope you've already experienced that, but let's talk about it for just a few moments, can we? Turn your Bibles to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2. We're going to look at, now we're going to look at the first five verses, the first five verses of the book of Mark chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. You there, say amen. 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 (laughs) Oh, me or amen, right? Still hear pages going. The Word of God says, verse 1, Mark chapter 2, he says, And again they entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there were no room to receive them. No, not as much uh, even at the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they, had, and when they, and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, meaning there's a lot of people there, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick was of the palsy lay. And Jesus saw their faith and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. God, though it's a familiar word to us, Father, may it never, ever lose its power. God, we we just pause and say thank you for being in this house. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, according to Matthew chapter 9, Capernaum was his own city. The city is located uh, on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, And it also happens to be the hometown of Peter and Andrew. Uh, It was a city that saw a lot of activity uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ from firsthand experience. They saw a lot, okay? Now, the question of the day is... When he works in our presence, do we still question his power and authority to do mighty things? Now, we have all seen God do mighty things in people, but do we doubt that he can do them in our lives? Do we doubt what we do? There's so many moving parts here. When Jesus was there, look, there were so many people, when he was preaching the word, so many people, there was, they couldn't even get in. There was, they were pressed together so heavily that they couldn't even move. Have you ever been in a situation where, where there were so many people that was gathered around you, you couldn't move? Several years ago, Connie and I and the family went to Gatlinburg, and we chose crazy as it was, chose to go downtown Gatlinburg on New Year's Eve. Can I give you a word of advice? Don't do that. Okay? So we got there real early, and we got this place right where the ball dropped, and, and, and so we're standing there, and all of a sudden, more people came, and more people came, and more people came, and there was more people in the city of Gatlinburg than I didn't think it was safe. It wasn't safe. I kid you not... Our family was, we were just immediately right by one another, but we literally, kid you not, could not move. Could not move. If there was some kind of catastrophe or something happened, no one could get anywhere. You think I'm exaggerating. I am not exaggerating. The fireworks got over, everything got over at midnight. Midnight. There were so many people, we did not get back to our place until 3.30, 3.45 that next morning. There were so many people there. We were pressed together so heavily, there was no moving. And you know, there's always that one person that tries to move around and go back and forth. 
they couldn't go. And so when I see that, when I see this picture where they were in this house and there were so many people and they were all pressed together, I think of that. I mean, just automatically because they couldn't, couldn't get anywhere. And see, Jesus was in the house and he was, he was sharing the word. Now, when Jesus is in the house, the word is, is revealed. Now, in verse 2, it says, Straightway, many gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive him. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. There's some specific things concerning Jesus in the house and preaching the word that we need to understand. First of which, it is a drawing power. It was heard that Jesus was in the house. Jesus was back. He had, been, he had been there in the past, and now he had returned. Now, the greatest thing that could ever happen to any church is for the word to get out that Jesus Christ is there. That's the greatest thing that could ever happen, even to this church, that Jesus Christ is going to show up on Sunday morning, and I want you to understand, bless God, folks would come out looking for Jesus. How many times have we went out witnessing and said, well, we'd love for you to come to our church. Jesus is going to be there Sunday. Some folks will look at you like you're crazy. And that's okay. If we truly believe that God is going to show up in the person of the Holy Spirit, that Christ and His salvation and His healing power is going to be there, then why don't we? It was noised about that he was going to be there. And I want you to understand, when we tell folks that Jesus is coming, to, to going to be there, he's going to be there, he's going to be there in the power of his Holy Spirit, wouldn't that be an awesome thing to see? Folks to come, and, and when folks come expecting a miracle, come expecting to be in the presence of God, it draws more people, and it draws more people, and it draws more people. I want to tell you something, Jesus has drawing power. Now, when the Word is revealed, I truly believe that the Word needs to be straightforward and simple. Now, when the Word is revealed, it draws a crowd. It draws a crowd. It draws a crowd. There's no two ways about it. It draws a crowd. It draws people with confidence. It draws people that, that, that have confidence. Not only to believe it, but to choose to live it by faith. You see, there's something about coming together in corporate worship, has been already said, that just moves. It moves God and it moves Him in their presence. And, and something happens when we come together. And, and this is what's happening here in this one little room house that, that Jesus was there and, and the Word was going out. And folks just pressed in there the best they could. They came in there with confidence. Now it draws folks who are crippled. It draws folks who are crippled. Crippled with sin. Crippled in their faith. Crippled to commit. Maybe even crippled in the body. How about crippled in their self-esteem and worry? Crippled in life itself. Do you today... Do you today feel crippled in a specific area of your life, of your, of your spiritual walk? Like I said earlier, we had this great example last week of, of folks filling the altar and just turning things over to the Lord. And I want you to understand, those chains are still broken today. Those, the, those things that were crippling you last week, if you left them at the altar, they're gone today. Healing came and healing comes because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. You see... How are we treating church? How are we treating gathering together and worshiping? It ought to be this, it ought to be this power-filled time. It ought to be the most anticipated thing you do all week long. And see, I, I fear that it's not. I fear that church is something that we do later. It's something that we put on the calendar if we don't have anything else going on. 
And I understand I'm preaching to the choir because you're here, bless God. Thank you for being here. But I want you to understand, it is the last thing on the calendar. It's not the last day of the week, folks. It is the first day of the week. How are we treating coming to church and worshiping God? You see, if we truly believed, if we truly believed that Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was going to show up every Sunday, then I want you to understand, if we truly believed it, there's nothing that would keep us away. Does that make sense? There's, there's nothing that should keep us away because everything else would go aside and say, I got to go and be in the presence of Jesus Christ. I got to go. And regardless of what's hurting us, regardless, regardless of what's crippling us, then, then we know that, that we're going to find relief in that. We're going to find relief in the power and the presence of Christ. You see, not only does it draw a crowd and it draws confidence, it, 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 it draws folks who need healing that are crippled, but you know what also it draws? It draws criticism. It draws criticism. And see, folks don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. It draws criticism because folks, they don't like to be out of control. They don't want someone else in control. Well, I want to tell you something. And can I just give you a little revelation, folks? You're not in control. You're not. And really, you need to deal with it. You're not in control. That would be God. Huh? That would be the Father. He's in control. And the sooner we learn to, to relinquish that control, we would truly understand that Christ is here through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you see, it draws criticism because it's not our way. Well, you know, God says to do this. Well, let me tweak it just a little bit to fit my lifestyle, to fit my schedule, to fit my calendar, to fit my family time, to fit this, this. And I want you to understand, there's no way to have a happy life if you have a miserable spiritual walk. By miserable, meaning just a to discount the power of Christ. You see, when the Word is revealed, it draws a crowd, and it draws people of confidence. It draws folks that are sick, but it truly does, it truly does draw criticism. Paul put, it, Paul put this in, in, in 1 Corinthians, and we don't have this, but that's okay. It's in, in chapter 15. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you that the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I have preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Meaning Paul has preached the word, that he has already received. He's preaching the word of salvation that he's already received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried, and then he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Well, let me ask you a question concerning those first four verses. Today, who wants to be saved? Today, who wants to be? Who wants a changed life today? You know, we, we walk around and we have these lives. And, and are, do we want to change life today? Maybe you're sitting there this morning and you're saved, but your life is just not where it needs to be. Maybe your life is not, is not exactly the, the, the perfect bed of roses that you want. Why don't you understand? Through Christ Jesus, you can have joy. Who wants to be saved today? Who wants to be different after you, after you get through today? Who, something's got to happen inside of our lives. Now, there's a couple of things here about these guys that, that took this man with the sick, sick of palsy and, and, and they tried to get in the door and then they got to the roof. I want you to understand a couple of things about their faith and, then, and we're going to be done today, okay? Because, you know, I want church to be a priority, but I don't want to be a burden. Their faith, their faith was persistent, persistent. Now I want to tell you something, that's, that's awesome. Because Jesus was in the house, and he was, they, these guys were persistent. They, they saw this. Now, can, can I just 
give you a little bit of a tidbit here. This guy, sick of the palsy, can't walk. He's sitting out on the side of the road, out in wherever, and everybody that went to go hear Jesus surely passed him by once on the way. They passed him by. Okay, so here they are. They're going to see Jesus, to be in the presence of Jesus. And, you know, they walk by this guy. Well, hey, how you doing? I'm going to see Jesus. There's no telling how many people walk by this guy to go get in the presence of Christ. Like Josh said, that's just a tad bit selfish. This passage is on determination through chapter, uh, verses 3 through 4. I want you to understand, so great was their love for this sick man and their faith and the power of Jesus that, that they would not take no for an answer. They were committed to go into any lengths to bring their problem and his problem to Christ. You see, faith says a few things to God and, and it says a few things to us. And about us. There are always many who will never reach Jesus unless someone takes them to Him. There are always people who will never reach Jesus unless someone takes them to Him. In, in, in this instance of the sick of the palsy, they tried to get, they saw him on the side of the road. They had compassion and determination. You're fixing to get healed. Can you imagine walking up to somebody who's sick and say, You're fixing to get healed. I'm fixing to take you into the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm fixing to take you in the presence of Jesus, and you're fixing to get healed. Their determination was awesome. Someone had to take that man into the presence of Christ for him to get healed. And all too many people walked by him, and all they needed to do was take him. Well, these guys saw that it had determination. See, faith says that first. If there, secondly, faith says if there were more bringing believers, there would be more saved sinners. If there were more bringing believers, there would be more saved sinners. If there were more folks like these guys that saw this guy that was sick of the palsy and they, they picked him up, if there was more people like that, there'd be more folks saved. Faith also says they, they had faith to believe Jesus to meet their need. Meet their need. Do you know that Jesus can meet your need? He can meet your need. Faith also says to put feet to our prayer. To put feet to our prayers. Faith says that they were not going to permit the difficult circumstances to discourage them. <laughs> I want to tell you something. That's so, boy, sometimes that just sort of hits right through the heart. Because discouragement sometimes just... Difficult circumstances discourage us. You know, these guys could have got this guy with sick palsy. Said, "Let's go. We're going to carry him. We've got him on this on this blanket." We, they could have got to the door and said, "Up, oh, they're full. Let's just go some other time. Maybe we go to the the five o'clock showing." I, I don't know what they were. You know what they were thinking, right? But no. They didn't permit the difficult circumstances to discourage them. They knew he needed Jesus. Faith also says they worked together and dared to do something different. They, so they got to the door and they couldn't get in the door, you understand. And you know, can you imagine what they were thinking? They, here they are standing at the door. They're going... You know, the doors, you can't even get in. Look at all these people. I wonder which one of them looked up and went, 
you know what? I bet if we raised them up on the roof, that old straw up there, we could break it apart. And we could lower him down. I'm going to tell you something. These guys were not scared of heights like I am, right? right, Think about it. They're up there. They're standing there going, you know, I bet we can get up there. Yeah, I think there's some rope right over there. Let's just get that rope and, and let's get up there and we'll drop him down. Now, I want you to understand something. Can you imagine? They're breaking away this thatched roof. All right, and here they go. They're lowering this guy down. I love this picture. This is, to me, one of the best stories. They're lowering this cat down there to Jesus, okay? And he's sick of the palsy, you know? Can you imagine what's going through his mind? You know, he's looking up, and these guys looking down at him, and they're just, can you imagine, they're just agreeing at him? You fixing to get it now, you know? I could just, I love this picture. They're, they're lowering him down. You fixing to get healed. Think about it. They didn't care about the obstacle. They knew somebody needed Jesus. They're looking up at that roof and they go, we can do it. They climb up on that roof. Now I want you to think about this. Everybody else in the room, they've got their spot. And what do you think they're thinking? Jesus stops teaching. He looks up. And you know, I like to think, I've got this, we got this picture at our house, it's, it's called Laughing Jesus, and I love that picture. Any of you that's been to the house, you've probably seen it when you walk in the front door. It's Jesus with the biggest grin on his face. I love that picture, you know, because my Jesus smiled. You, you hear me? He smiled. Can you imagine him looking up and just grinning, thinking, wow, that's faith. That's faith. Man, they just, they didn't care. And, and, and can you imagine the guy's looks on their faces that's lowering him down? Jesus makes eye contact with them. And they're just agreeing like, yeah, we did it. Think about it. Is that not the greatest picture you've ever seen? Jesus looking up and them looking down at him. And between them is this man that can't even move. They just wanted to get him in his presence. There is, to me, this is the greatest story of whatever it takes. Where is our faith? Where is our determination? If you're the one today that needs healing, whatever it takes, We've got to put it at the feet of Jesus. If, if, if you're the one who is committed to do what it takes to bring someone to Jesus, to, to bring them to their healing, for whatever that is, can you get a couple of folks together and just go? And, and whatever it takes. Because I want you to understand something. Being a Christian, and you hear me now, being a Christian is not a spectator sport. It's not a spectator sport. Now, second, forgiveness is, is, is present. Forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus has ever performed. I want you to understand that. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. It brings the greatest blessing. And it lasts forever. Forgiveness. Let me share that with you again now. It meets the greatest need. It costs the greatest price. And it brings the greatest blessing. But it lasts forever. He looked at, he looked at the guy sick of the palsy and said, Your sins are forgiven. It's interesting that sin, a sin-hardened soul can always be melted by the words of Christ. The dead is discarded, the guilt is gone, the conscience is cleaned, the past is pardoned, 
and the record is removed. We hear stories like this, and, and to me, I, I just I am just in love with this story because of the pictures that we get out of it. And, but I have to ask this question this morning before we go: and Do we hear God? Do you hear God? Do you hear Him? Do you hear Him talk? Do you hear Him share? Do you hear Him nudge? In that still small voice, do you still hear Him? I know we listen. I know we listen. But do we hear? It's a big difference, don't you think? It's a big difference. You ever been on the phone with somebody and you just know they're not listening to you? You just know. You just know they're not hearing you. You just know it. You just know it. And then after a while, you think they've hung up and you go, Hello? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm here. Are we engaged in a conversation with the Father? I know, I know, I know that there's, I know, I know you, we say we're listening, but do we truly hear what he's saying? There's some great examples of, of the storms hearing him. You remember those stories? He, Jesus is in the boat and the storm gets up and they wake him up. And, and Jesus tells, tells the storm to be quiet. Guess what? The storm got quiet. We find that in Matthew, Mark, and, and even Luke. In, in Matthew and Mark, Jesus talked to a fig tree. He said, you're never going to bear fruit again. Guess what? It withered and died. It didn't bear fruit again. But do we hear him? For you see, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever is committed to him shall never die but have everlasting life. Are you committed? Do we hear him? Do we hear him? Do we do, do, do the words, when we read our Bible, does it mean something to us? You see, these guys wanted to be a trendsetter for church. Do whatever it takes to bring folks into the presence of Christ. If it meant breaking up a roof, I don't think Jesus was upset about his roof at all. Do you? I don't believe so. I believe he thought it was great faith. But there's something about hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Are we, list, are we going to hear him? Or have we just tuned him out because we've heard it so many times? I want to show you something about about God's grace and about us hearing Him. Let's go ahead, David. It's not easy being a parent. There's this balance I find myself constantly trying to find. When Emily came along, there was really this new sense of purpose that came from learning to put her needs above my own. When I think about this first Christmas as being a father, I think about what is the best gift that I can get my daughter in a way that she would understand it. When we were six months pregnant, I was told that your baby can hear your voice inside the womb. So I started reading to her, singing songs, just talking to her throughout the day. And when she was born, I remember being across the room from her and hearing her cry and just the fear in her voice. Uh, the nurses were trying to calm her down, but uh, she just continued to cry. So um, I went over to her and I looked at her and I just said her name. I just said Emily. 
And immediately she stopped. She looked up at me and she recognized my voice. It was, it was incredible. And then it struck me. The greatest thing that I can give is not a thing. The greatest gift I can give my children is me. Sacrificially, wholeheartedly, the gift of life. There's this realization, isn't that what Christmas is all about? God, a loving Father, giving himself to his children so we can live. Do you hear his voice? Are you hearing his voice? Amongst all the turmoil, everything that's going on in your life, and when all of that goes on, he is simply looking and calling your name. He sacrificially gave his son, Jesus Christ, for you and for me. And we know that he is here. It draws a crowd. But how persistent is our faith? He's calling your name. I love that little story because when the baby was crying at the nursery, he just called her name. She quietened down. He's doing the same for you. You see, you are his child. And in your trouble in your tears, in your pain, He is calling your name. This Christmas, this new year, would you hear His voice? Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for your loving nature, for your grace for what you've done, for how you've blessed us. Father, I pray that if there's anybody here that just needs you, Father, that they would not hesitate and Father I pray people would not be discouraged or embarrassed to go and get somebody who needs a touch from you today I pray Father that that's our way of life to do whatever it takes to bring somebody to your presence, to your feet. For we know that's the only way, only way, Father, that they're going to receive what you want to give them. Accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Would you come? Our leaders are going to be standing up here. If you want to join this church, you come. We'll take care of everything. This is the time to come. This is the time to pray. This is the time to go to somebody and say, let me pray with you. We don't do invitations as normal around here. This ought to be the most activity we do all service long. So let's stand, we'll sing, you pray, you go. Let's do something for Jesus today. Whatever it takes.